So let's start with the Pope Deepfake, which took the world by storm.、Um, deepfake technology is quickly becoming, many would say, out of control. For example, the the Pope in the puffer jacket AI picture that went viral everywhere. My wife was convinced it was real, and I was for a little bit as well.、Yeah. Um, and soon. Many people will say it will be completely impossible to tell if a picture is real or not. So, look, you're an expert on AI. You have an AI company, researcher at the University of Cambridge. How will we know what's real? What, what's your take on, I guess, deep fakes and and the Pope in the puffer jacket being the the most famous example? Yeah. So I think I completely agree with your thesis. First of all, I think we are perhaps twelve to fifteen months away before photos become. Perfectly photorealistic. Yeah, and by that I mean no detector, whether human or AI model, is going to work again.、Um, maybe for videos, we're a few more months away, twenty-four, thirty months away.、Um, we've all seen Sora, and、yeah. Sora performs really, really well.、Uh, there's still artifacts that we can use to detect things, but I think we're on the same trajectory there. I think in the future, there's a pessimistic side of me, and there's an optimistic side of me.、Um, the pessimistic side of me. Imagines that we lose all trust in the evidentiary value of photos and videos going forward.、Uh, it used to be the case that if you saw a photo, it meant something; it proved something. Pick saw it didn't happen. Is the yeah, 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 phrase. yeah, yeah.、Um, in the pessimistic scenario, we do not create the guardrails necessary、um, to be able to do that again. And then the only way that people trust things is by looking at the source, you know, the person who's claiming something. Uh, and that just leads us down to deeper and deeper filter bubbles.、Mm. People believe in something because it agrees with their viewpoints. They dismiss it as a deep fake if it doesn't. Yeah.、Right? Um, and that is a scary world, and I don't want to live in that world.、Um, there's a second pessimistic scenario, which is、uh, a bunch of companies, you know, large tech corporations, decide that okay, well, we're going to start signing things. We're going to Uh, say that a photo is trusted or a video is trusted because someone uploaded it to our service and we are the authorities. I call this the Ministry of Truth sure,、uh, model. Sure. Yeah, and that's scary for a completely different reason. In the sense that it completely monopolizes the internet, it centralizes it, it consolidates it even more、uh, to the point where to have your voice heard, to have your stories heard, you're going to have to some have some sort of a relationship with these large companies, and that's the only way your voice is ever going to get heard.、Mm. The optimistic scenario. Is that we come up with ways to create proofs of photos and videos, whether by establishing some sort of trust in the device that was used to capture the photos or videos, or by proving、um, the secure storage of photos and videos in historical archives, and do it in a decentralized manner, so that no single company, no single organization has authority over which individual photos and videos get trusted.、Mm. And that's where your company comes in. That's、yeah. what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're creating a decentralized trust layer for、yeah. photos and videos in a world where the pixels themselves don't mean much.、Mm. We're creating a, a side channel, effectively, a, a new reason to trust photos and videos again. So your tech would have detected the whole Kate Middleton fiasco with the fake Photoshop picture. We'll, we'll shut it on, put it on the screen right now. But、yeah. um, would that have happened, or is it more AI focused stuff? No. So detection is not the right model here. Okay,、uh, and that is sort of the core thesis of Open Origins: is that detection is a stopgap. It is a game of whack-a-mole.、Um, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of context on this. Right, when I was a PhD student at Cambridge, way back in 2017, we made very early deep fake detectors. 2017, only like you know, deep researchers had heard of deep fakes, had been experimenting sure, sure. with them.、And、like one of the ways that we could detect deep fakes was figuring out that. Hey, deepfakes don't really know how to blink very well. They didn't have the right consistency of blinking. They didn't have the right speed of blinking.、Uh, it just didn't look very natural compared to a real human being's blinking patterns. Or, or too many fingers. No, or too many. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a later story. Deepfakes,、yeah. the ones that we were looking at, just、uh, swapped out the face. Yeah.、Um, and we could use that blinking quirk in deepfakes to figure out which is a deepfake or not.、Right? But even as That、uh, detection technology was being developed. Everyone knew that the moment this gets published, it's going to be used to make a deepfake that knows how to blink properly, and that's what happened. Within six months, this blinking quirk disappeared, and 
the whole AI photo detection, video detection world has been playing this game of whack-a-mole. Mm. They keep discovering new quirks. Those keep getting used to create better deepfakes, better synthetic photos, better synthetic videos. To the point where we'll eventually get to a point where we run out of quirks. You know, there are no moles to whack anymore. Um, so we're not interested in playing that game. We don't do detection. What we're interested in doing is allowing honest creators, honest editors, honest archivists to prove what has happened to their content. So in the Kate Middleton scenario, if the royal family wanted to be transparent, wanted to show that you know, this is actually her with her kids. They put it through your platform. They yeah, would have taken yeah. a photo using a device yeah. running our software. Um, they would have uploaded it to um, whatever service they were using. Um, a proof of that photo would have gone to our blockchain from where we could have correlated and corroborated uh, that nothing has been changed. Okay, got you. Okay. What about going beyond pictures and, and videos? Because one more potentially even dangerous form is AI voice cloning. Okay, so some people have been receiving calls recently, mm -hmm. and it sounds like it's a family member and they're in an emergency situation and they need money and they need help. But it turns out it's just like an AI scam. And, and you can imagine this being run on mass scale downloading because anybody could make me say anything. There's hundreds yeah. of hours of my voice online, right? If anybody gets a call from me asking for money, it's, it's not me. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, but yeah. Like, so how can people avoid being scammed? I will say that you're not in a unique position here. You don't need hours of uh, audio. No, a couple, couple, like, couple of sentences. Yeah, a, few, right. a few seconds is all you need. Mm. Um, so at a, at a surface level, there really shouldn't be much of a difference between audio, photo, and video. Right? If, you, if you're using some sort of a trusted hardware to validate the photos, we could use something similar for microphones and validate audio. But it turns out it's a little bit trickier than that. Um, when we do photo and video authentication, we're not only uh, establishing trust in the device, establishing trust in the fact that there is a real camera sensor attached to the device, that it is capturing something in real time. It's a live feed, uh, not a replay of an older feed. But we're also creating a 3D depth map. Yeah. Right. So uh, when someone takes a photo using uh, our app or via a camera connected to our app, like a DSLR camera, we create a depth map of what is in front of the camera sensor. Right? So when I take a photo of your face, it will have curvature, right? like a normal human being's face. Whereas if someone took a photo of a screen showing your face, it will appear perfectly flat. Mm. Right? And that is a critical piece. If you don't have that, then someone could just take a photo, edit it, put it on a monitor, take a photo of the monitor, and then pass it off as an original. Right? So this picture of picture prevention is critical to authenticating the source of the image. Doing the same thing for audio is actually quite hard. Yeah, um, yeah. The difference from a microphone's perspective um, between my vocal cords saying what I'm saying right now versus someone recording this and then editing it and then playing it over a high fidelity speaker is quite hard to detect. Like it, there are there are mechanisms to do this. Uh, they work in laboratory conditions, but so far in the real world, this is actually quite hard to do. Mm. So my answer is twofold. One is. Yes, you should obviously authenticate uh, what is happening at a device level. Yeah. Right? So yeah. you should authenticate audio clips going forward the same way that we're going to start authenticating photos and videos. But also keep in mind the caveat that photos and videos have uh, an easier time of being provable than audio. Mm. Me and my wife have just uh, come up with a, yeah, if I say safe word, it sounds uh, like it's got a different meaning. But um, yeah, we have a safe word, basically, if I was to call her and, and, and she didn't believe it was me or vice versa, then we have a secret code word. I guess it's probably something people should start thinking about in, a, in, in the yeah. world that we live in. Um, it gets a lot harder when you're talking about an organization, though, right? Uh, I don't know if you came across this, but there was recently a, a scam in Singapore, I believe. I saw where, it. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty five million dollars were stolen from a company by someone faking the CFO's voice. Yeah. Yeah. Um I don't see how a safe word I mean I, you might do I, I read it. I yeah. felt like it might have been an inside job. Just it hmm. it seemed too perfect for it just to be uh, okay. an AI scam. Okay. But um okay. we'll see. Um Okay, so look let, let, let's look at Sam Altman because in the past year, two years, you know, artificial intelligence has just taken over the world. Mm -hmm. And 
as the founder and CEO of an AI company, um, you must have an opinion on ChatGPT, on, on, on Sam, on Dali, on, on, on Sora, on everything that he's creating. So um, what, what are your thoughts on, I guess, that individual and, and what he's built? I don't have strong opinions on the individual. Um, I don't know him personally. Um, I have strong opinions on how they've gone about releasing and training uh, their models. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this is this is a bit of a controversial take in the AI community, but uh, I don't think you have the right to just use copyright holders' data without their permission um, to make billions off of it without uh, sharing in the upside with the people who actually contributed to the model. Like the the value of your model is indistinguishable from the content that was used to create it. Um, so I know which side I'm picking in the lawsuits that are happening. Sure. Um, and I know that a lot of my friends on the media side and on the security side of things agree with me on that, but not maybe not necessarily on the AI side of things. Um, I mean, uh, it gets to a point where we're doing celebrity gossip, right? <laughs> where, um, you know, there, there have obviously been these uh, fairly high profile accusations against him by his own sister about his yes, conduct. Yes, um, yes, yes. It is very much a he said, she said thing, but it does sound like her story is quite credible. Mm. Um, so that makes me a, quite hesitant to have that person leading such a big organization, that's such an influential organization. Um, and as far as the organization itself goes, I don't think OpenAI is living up to the open part of its name anymore. Mm. Um, they've been increasingly more and more secretive about how they're training their models, what is being used, the internal architecture. Um, I think it it has strayed away so far from its non-profit open source ethos that it is much more Microsoft now than it is OpenAI. So, you know, Elon Musk is now suing OpenAI. Mm-hmm. He did a joke X and said if they change the name to closed AI, then he'll drop the lawsuit. Mm-hmm. What's your take on what Elon's doing? I mean, Elon is trolling, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> but... It would be a much more accurate representation of what OpenAI is if they tra- change their name to Close AI. Yeah, right? they are not an open company anymore. No. What about the bigger vision? I, mean, and I say this as a co- person who has the word "open" in their own company. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's, a, that's a good point. That's a good point. So, have you got open sourced technology? Because yes. okay, yes, we've we've open sourced basically the entire tooling except some of the security critical pieces that we aren't sure exactly how sure. to open source, but. We've always had an open source first approach. Okay, I'm glad that was the answer. That would have been very awkward if, it, if the answer was no. But okay, I would have to read in my company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Sam's ultimate vision is is AGI. Mm-hmm. Do you believe AI will become sentient? Will become self aware? If it does, I don't think it's this way. Um, I I think there is a almost functional view of intelligence um, that is being taken by a lot of computer scientists, um, including my colleagues where we rate intelligence based on what it is able to do. Right? We're like, oh, it is really competent at coding. It is really competent at writing essays. Um, but we don't really talk about the internal experience of intelligence. Right? Like, I would argue that my claim to humanity and my claim to being an intelligent being has very little to do with what I've done or what I do with the external world, but more to do with my own inner world. Mm. Um, and how you can make the claim that these neural networks have anything resembling the inner worlds that you and I have, uh, I just don't see that. Sure. Um, so I think we will reach human competence across a variety of tasks or exceeding human competence across a variety of tasks within a few years. Like that, I agree with. Whether we can call it AGI, I don't think so. So you you believe that the the AI will be able to present itself as a human, but you don't believe it will actually be conscious. It will actually have a, a soul, whatever that means. Uh, yeah, I'm not even being as esoteric as the soul. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about more tangible things, even like motivation. Okay. Right. Um, I think the AI models will become more and more competent, right? Like given any task, they will do it as well as an adult human being, at least. Um but the process by which they arrive at those answers uh, or fulfill those functionalities is not the same as what we do. So maybe there's a different term that we need to use for this kind of intelligence, but it certainly isn't human intelligence. Okay. You mentioned different models just then. 
Uh, one of the original co-founders of OpenAI, Elon Musk, uh, he released Grok, his chat GPT competitor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you managed to have a look at Grok, but um, do you have any opinions on, on Elon Musk and I guess what he's doing with XAI? I have no clue what they're doing at XAI. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, very secretive. It, it, yeah. yeah, I mean, he should also call it close the eye. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't played with Grok. Um, I kind of don't know what projects of Elon's to take seriously at all. Um, like, for example, with uh, Hyperloop and the Boring Company, yeah. right? Like, made a big fuss about it. There was such a big hype cycle around it, but then it later turns out he did it all to derail California's high-speed railway, right? So that was clearly a very tactical ploy to derail an otherwise good infrastructure project for material gain, whereas he had no real intention of actually doing that project. I think the Boring Company mostly sells flamethrowers now and uh, okay. tequila or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm like... I, I don't generally take Elon's statements seriously. I don't generally take his project seriously. I, I think I've crossed over to the point where, um, you know, gone from innocent until proven guilty to guilty until proven innocent. I just assume anything coming out of that source is not trustworthy. I don't give it any thought unless and until I'm proven wrong. Okay. He is on the more fearful side of the AI coin. People like uh, Jeffrey Hinton the other day said it's like a 10% chance in the next 5 to 20 years that all humans on the planet will be made extinct from, from AI. Elon Musk has said that AI is more dangerous than nuclear weapons. Hmm. Um, what, what's your take on that? I think AI is very dangerous given the economic system we live in. Um, you know, we don't have good social security. We don't have social safety. Um, we're going to see mass layoffs. And that is a, the main way, I think, in which AI is going to affect us going forward. And that's going to result in destabilization of society. It's going to result in a lot of knock-on side effects that are really, really harmful. I don't see a Terminator scenario. Um, I don't see a rogue AI going and taking over a nuclear arsenal and launching nukes. Um, so I don't agree with the statement that at least with the AI we see today, or I can see going forward five to 10 years, that they're as dangerous as nuclear weapons, when nuclear weapons kill millions of people at the push of a button. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't see that happening with AI. What about people that would say, like, it might not be nuclear weapons, but if I just give you some hypothetical situations, right? I'm, I'm literally going to yeah. think of these off the top of my head, yeah. but maybe um, so facial recognition technology um, strapped onto a drone, which has got a gun strapped onto it, which the drone, if it sees people of a certain uh, ethnicity or gender, it will then just open fire and yeah. you, you release hundreds of those simultaneously in different locations around the world. Um, you could have AI which could recreate phishing emails and and instantly create, you know, fake websites which look like bank accounts and then they instantly will write emails going out to people to trick them into logging in and steal billions and billions that way. Yeah. So, I mean, look, it's not nuclear weapons, but do, do you see that AI could have a really, really disastrous effect on, on, on the world from that perspective? Uh, not just... Do I think that I'm convinced that that is going to happen? Yeah. Like that's the reason I started the company in the first place. Because yeah. the first time I came across deep fakes, the first time I came across a, a synthetic photo, um, there was this website. I don't think they, they, they have an open API anymore. It's called this person does not exist.com. Oh yeah. I've seen this. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy, right? It's yeah. It's really good. Scary. Um, yeah, yeah. and the first time I came across those things, uh, alarm bells just started going off in my head. Um, and, I was a security researcher uh, at Cambridge. I'm, I'm trained to see how a piece of technology can be misused. Uh, that is what we did. You know, we figured out how it's going to be misused and stop that from happening, or figured out how to break existing systems. Right? That is what we did throughout our uh, research. And AI just lends itself so well to all kinds of uh, maluses. Um, deepfakes and photos happen to be the one that I think is the most high-profile instantiation of that. The thing that you're mentioning with, you know, sophisticated phishing um, or, you know, drones that are auto auto autonomous uh, weapon systems. Yeah. Um, I think the second one doesn't sound as likely to me just because that would require... It's not a very scalable attack unless you have the resources of a military. Mm. Right? Like, yes, it can work to kill a few tens of people, and that is terrible, and that would be a tragedy. But it is not the sort of thing that I would expect 
to happen without uh, a military being involved for it to scale to a population level. You'd need a lot of money, wouldn't you? Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah And yeah, then yeah. at that point, you might as well start bombing. Sure, sure. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm convinced AI is going to result in a whole flurry of scams. It's going to result in uh, election destabilization. Mm. Half the world goes towards this year. And it's a scary, scary time for us to be reaching this inflection point with AI as, it, as that is happening. Um, in my own home country of India, uh, we've already seen deep fakes of opposition leaders being spread around on WhatsApp. WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted. It's really hard to know how many people have seen those. Most people believe things at face value when they receive it in WhatsApp. Um, all of that is genuinely destabilizing society, and that's all rests at the hands of AI. Okay, so you're uh, from India originally. Okay, so another famous Indian, um, Sundar Pichai. Mm -hmm. um, he has been heavily criticized recently because of Google's failure to keep up with OpenAI um, to some degree. Now, their first attempt at a large language model with, with BARD, it didn't really take off. There was a huge issue with some fake information and the stock price went down. Um, recently, they had uh, Gemini, and that seems to be like insanely woke. I don't really know how else to describe it. Like you could type in, give me a picture of Alfie Wattam and it will come up with like a black guy. Like it's, it's just completely random. Um, so what are your thoughts on Sundar? Uh, and what are your thoughts on Google's, let, let, let's say struggling AI efforts compared to where most people would imagine they would be at this point? I think first of all, the comparison between OpenAI and Google search has never really made sense to me. Um, I don't want my search results to be AI. Like I want them to be as close to Google Scholar search results, right? Like I want genuine hard references and I want to make up my own mind based on those search results. Um, so I think that is a, a false choice that is being pushed and I don't know why that is being pushed. Right? I, I see the convenience of ChatGPT, um, but ChatGPT is not a replacement for a search engine. Uh, and I think Google is being quite cautious with rolling out these AI features in Google search. They have these summarizing, uh, summarizing tools now. Mm. But I generally agree with their approach um, of not going all in on just replacing the search box with the chat engine. So I, I agree with that. Uh, I do think Gemini is pretty good. Um, like its performance in like just random coding tasks, I played around with it a bit, seems to be much better than GPT-4, just subjectively speaking. Um, Claude, I think, does the best, though. Mm. Uh, Anthropic's Claude. I love Claude. It's great, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think, yeah, I think yeah. Claude's, at least coding performance. I have two use cases for my chatbots. One is to help me write code snippets that, just for a demo uh, and to make my emails more polite. Okay. <laughs> the second one, all of them do fine enough. Yeah. Uh, the first one, um, I think Claude is by far the best. Um, when it comes to just generally Google and its AI performance, um, I think it's too early to tell. Um, I think OpenAI clearly has the public awareness. It has the mind share right now. I don't generally think that GPT-4 is in any way better than the other two, like clearly better than uh, Claude or uh, Gemini. Um, I worry that Google overinvests in this AI hype cycle. Um, you know, I think the the non-disruptive um, use cases or the non-destructive use cases um, for AI still remain to be fleshed out. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of those use cases are actually enterprise products, right? Like making spreadsheets easier to digest, things like that. Um, where I think having the uh, market share that Google Docs has is going to be a much bigger competitive advantage than just having a marginally better LLM. Mm. So I'm not worried about Google. They're, doing, they're going to be fine. <laughs> I'm sure they will. But yeah, I mean, it's Google, right? Yeah. Um, Sundar was recently asked about AI replacing jobs, and he was criticized because he didn't give a very clear answer um, in terms of which industries, which sectors were going to be disrupted the most. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts? Like, which jobs do you believe are going to be at risk? I mean, the obvious ones, self-driving cars, replacing Uber and truck drivers and... Um, you know, robots powered by AI replacing, you know, cleaners and assistants and that sort of thing. But what, what else? Where, where does this go? Like, what what do you believe is at risk? I actually think that the ones that you've listed are less at risk than the ones that I'm thinking of. I think the the first ones to go are junior code developers. Mm -hmm. right? Like, I I don't see a future in which we hire as many developers as we do today. Like, there aren't, in my opinion, ten x 
um, coding projects out there. So I don't see why we would need the same number of uh, coders when these AI tools are just getting good enough that someone at an architect level can just do the job themselves without needing a full team. Uh, and I think we're reaching that inflection point within a couple of years where all the junior dev roles just disappear. Um, and, you know, again, I come from India. That's that's how most people get their, uh, like most educated Indians get their start. You know, that's where you start climbing the ladder. So I really worry about what happens when you take out the bottom rung of the ladder. How do you get started uh, on the climb? You're not going to get hired as your first job as a software architect. Um, so how are you going to get there? Um, and I don't think we have a clean answer for that. Uh, I do think generally a lot of uh, STEM jobs, a lot of uh, finance jobs are a lot more at risk um, than there is public discourse about them. Uh, a lot of the public discourse has focused on self-driving cars um, or like design jobs, uh, which to be fair, are at risk. But it appears to me that as far as reproducibility and replicability go, the STEM jobs, the finance jobs are much more, much easier to just replace. Mm -hmm. Plus, there's a much bigger incentive because their pays are also higher. So those are the ones I'm worried about. The ones I'm not worried about are, you know, psychologists, teachers, places where you do want a human touch. AI is never going to replace them. Um, so if I was going to advise someone just about to enter university, I would say, Maybe don't do STEM. Maybe right. maybe go okay. for maybe go for psychology. It's interesting because we, you know, you'd think that the first jobs to really be replaced would be blue collar type manual automated jobs, but in reality, it's it's lawyers, it's accountants, yeah. it's you know, uh, co copywriters who are at risk. Bricklaying is really hard work. Yeah, we've we've been trying to create machines to do bricklaying. Yeah, it just haven't worked out. People have been trying to three D print houses, hasn't yeah. really worked out at scale. The, the physical world seems to be much harder to tame yeah. than just knowledge work. Yeah. So I'm, I'm much more concerned about, about junior knowledge workers. Uh, Boston Dynamics, like it's great to see their robots trying to do construction, but in reality, they're even better at doing dances. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's uh, I can't wait to go to the Sydney Opera House <laughs> seeing a Boston Dynamics robot doing the entire opera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I went there once. Um, it was an amazing place, but uh, I would have much preferred to have seen humans doing the, the opera, to, to be honest, rather than spot or stretch or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, For now. Yeah, For now. <laughs> yeah. Let, let me ask you about Mark Zuckerberg. Um, yeah. He's been implementing AI into lots of Meta's products. Um, I have, I'm not wearing them right now, but I have smart glasses so I can look at something and say, hey, tell me about this, and it will instantly use a language model to mm -hmm. give me information about what I'm looking at. Um, and I, that could be a TV show, a, a car, anything. Um, and a lot of people say that, like, because of AI, Mark and Meta, like, perhaps they were a little bit too early with the whole Metaverse, and maybe they should have just waited a few years and changed the name of Facebook to AI Book or something. Maybe they've kind of caught on the wrong trend. Um, what are your thoughts on, on Mark? What are your thoughts we might on be Meta? having the exact same discussion about the next hype cycle. Maybe, yeah. Like, yeah. Two years down the line, we might be like, why, why? Why did they do that? Why did they implement an LLM into a smart yeah. class? That AI? No sense. What, what's this? You what know, was that? We've got free yeah. houses now. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, to some degree, it's it's the curse of capitalism, right? Like, you grow really big. You've monopolized the whole market. The market isn't expanding anymore. It's a stagnant market. How are you going to uh, give a return to your more recent investors? Like, you need to find a new ground to break. Yeah. Um, I don't think as far as, like, large-scale bets go, Metaverse was a very bad idea. I think their implementation was terrible. Their PR around uh, their launches were was terrible. Uh, I genuinely think Oculus, uh, the hardware is amazing. Like, I've been using VR headsets for like, I don't know, six, seven years now. And Oculus has always been really, really good. And their uh, price to performance has been amazing in the last couple of generations. Um, but yeah, they had, they had a bit of a PR nightmare. They had a bit of a issue with actually creating viable use cases that you know everyday people could resonate with yeah. um, as far as AI integration into um, Facebook's products or Meta's products go as a person who doesn't really use social media I struggle to see obvious use cases uh, what they, I, they have a snoop dog uh, person that you can chat to in Facebook Messenger 
And that's like the, the, the coolest thing I've seen. But it's not exactly like going to change the world, is it? So is it, is it what, what does it do? It's just a chatbot that yeah, talks in the tone of Snoop Dogg. Basically, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I use uh, Waze, my mapping service, and there you can have a 70s DJ as your voice guide. So yeah. I'm not averse to the idea of just adding some personality to your tech. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't see obvious use cases. What I do see uh, as a responsibility on Meta's part is they're in the position where they control the information flow for billions of people. And as the internet gets more and more polluted with synthetic content, they're going to be the player that decides how we deal with synthetic content going forward. So, so far, they've announced things like if you upload a photo that was created using uh, Adobe Firefly or one of the five big AI models, um, there will be a label mm. which states this was created using AI. But that is a very, very fragile scheme. First of all, you need to go via one of the approved vendors. Right? If I wanted to trick the system, I could just use one of the other ones. If I wanted to trick the system, I could just take a screenshot of the yeah. thing. Before I was I just checked. thinking that. So you could go into Mid Journey, into Dali, into Playground, into whatever, and then you could just literally screenshot it and re-upload it. It's uh, behind the scenes. What is happening is that there is a metadata file uh, yeah. in a format called C two PA, um, which is a, uh, in my opinion, kind of unnecessary uh, metadata file format introduced by Adobe um, a couple of years ago, um, where they're keeping track of what has happened to this photo. They're not keeping track of whether this photo is actually real or not. What they're keeping track of is um, John Doe says they used Photoshop on this image at this time. Right? They're not checking whether they changed the color, whether they cropped it. It just says, use this tool at this time. Um, what Meta is doing with all of that um, C2BF file format information is it's looking for was the first entry on this an AI tool, right? So is the uh, is there an entry in the metadata that says this image was created using Adobe Firefly on this date? If there is, it gets the tick mark. If there isn't, it doesn't get a tick mark. Right? Um, several problems with this screenshot, as we've talked about, but you can also just as easily remove the metadata, right? You, everyone knows how to just remove EXIF data from an image. It's the same thing. Mm. Just remove it share it as a JPEG instead of a C2PA, that is not going to work anymore. And I can see why Meta is taking this very, very, very light touch approach, basically an opt into being honest approach, because going slightly harder might mean that they devalue a bunch of their content. Mm -hmm. Like let's say tomorrow they roll out a feature in Instagram where if a photo has been touched up, it gets a cross. If a photo has not been touched up, it gets a tick mark. If it came straight from the camera, that would mean 90% plus of the content on Instagram gets across, which is devaluing their own content, which is affecting their own brand. Um, I also think that they might be worried about being perceived as uh, taking on an editorial role, which goes against the stance that they've taken legally. That yeah. They're a platform, therefore they're not subject to all the regulations that uh, newspapers are. Um, but I'm afraid that they won't have the luxury anymore. And like, I think they are going to have to do more than just rely on people preserving some obscure metadata file um, if we are to have any sort of shared sense of reality on these platforms. Mm. Um, and especially given how many major elections are coming up, I really hope that they start rolling out these harder or tougher restrictions on images that are not authenticated. I mean, I, I do believe that this election cycle, there will be fake deep fake videos of one candidate saying one thing shared by anonymous troll farms to try and sway a public narrative. Yeah. So um, It's happened already. Yeah. Right? Um, it doesn't get a lot of coverage because it didn't happen in you know, the West. Uh, but it happened already in Indian local elections mm -hmm. two years ago, I think, where f deep fakes of opposition party leaders saying some really outrageous things went viral, completely deep faked. Yeah. Like, that they never said those things. And I'm convinced that those kinds of videos have changed public perception of that candidate, which resulted in the other one, uh, the other guy winning. Um, yeah, we are going to see that happening in the West, and I don't think we're at any in any way in a better place to deal with that kind of an attack than we were two years ago. Mm. And that rests solely on Meta. Mm. One thing that Meta does not have a good reputation for is handling users' data. 
Okay, yeah. this is more in the Facebook days, and maybe that's why they rebranded in in many parts. But um, do you think it's possible that I guess Meta and other big tech companies, once they start really applying AI to our data to get us even more hooked on the algorithm, and TikTok becomes almost a thing where you you can't leave it alone, if to, to some degree. I mean, do, do you think that these big tech companies are basically going to become like unstoppable at, at that point? I think they're already unstoppable. Um, I think the network effects mean that if you want to launch a competitor to these services, best of luck. Yeah, it's it's just so hard uh, to cause both the mass user shift, but also to have people um, uh, create their social circles again, right? Their social graph again on a different platform. It, it, we've seen people uh, try Blue Sky, Mastodon. I mean, Threads is Meta, but still didn't e- still didn't even really take off. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and I think they, they always have this kind of trajectory, right? Where they have a initial nice feature. There's something nice about these platforms. They take off. They reach a hundred thousand, maybe up to a million users, something like that. Burial obviously was the best performer in that regard. They went up to hundred million users, or mm. something like that. And then there's a drop off just because there isn't the same kind of uh, built up repository of content. There isn't the entire social graph carried over over years of people having social connections on these platforms. Um, And also people just want to use one or two or three apps, right? They're not switching over 10 different apps for doing the exact same thing. Uh, which is why you also see all of the same content being rehashed across several platforms, right? Like yeah. TikToks are basically shorter YouTubes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think there is a there is a natural duopoly or monopoly that happens because of user preferences. And the second thing that happens is because market authorities haven't really enforced any kind of antitrust regulation, you know, haven't forced these organizations to open up the social graph. Like, why can't I take my social graph from Meta? And transport it over to Blue Sky and have the same connections. We have good good protocols to do this. XMPP has existed for twenty years. It's just that no one has forced these companies to do it. And until sure. that happens, I think all the discussions around uh, how addictive the AI algorithms are are kind of besides the point. Um, their monopoly is not going to get threatened until that opening up happens. Okay, let me ask you about one last person. Uh, we've talked Mark Zuckerberg. We've talked Sundar Pichai. We've talked Elon Musk. We've talked Sam Altman. Let me ask you about Tim Cook. Um, there hasn't been many major AI initiatives announced at Apple. They even cancelled their self-driving car projects mm-hmm. the other day, and that had been, you know, decades of work and billions and billions spent. Um, however, I believe they cancelled that to move the people over to like a Gen AI team. Um, but what are your thoughts on Tim Cook and, I guess, Apple's lack of public AI projects? I mean, Tim Cook, Tim Cook in my head is like the polar opposite of Elon Musk, right? Like, no one knows what he's thinking at any point. He's sure. just this uh, reserved man who does optimization better than anyone else. Like, that's what I think of when I think of Tim Cook, the guy who knows how to optimize um, existing product lines. He was the COO, so that's in his DNA, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I'm actually quite glad that Apple hasn't been rash with just randomly adopting or integrating more and more AI into their products. I think they're doing it in a very measured way. They try to do it in a way that actually adds utility to their users' lives. Um, I wish more companies took the Apple approach on this. Uh, I think, as with every hype cycle, people are very, very keen to do the new thing. You know, it's the new shiny thing. Uh, and that's why, why is Microsoft, why has Microsoft integrated Copilot into Windows as like a first-class citizen? I don't know. I never asked for it. I don't think anyone had really asked for that. Um, so I like the Apple approach. I think they're being measured. I think they're, w- when they do introduce new features, I'm much more hopeful of those actually adding utility to my life, uh, making my life easier rather than being more noise in an already noisy world, mm. uh, which is what I feel about most AI products, at least the B2C ones. I just hope they can make Siri like understand yes. what I'm saying because yes. it's terrible. And Siri is really bad with accents. She doesn't yeah, understand yeah. my accent at all. Yeah, my wife's from China and uh, doesn't understand it's it. almost funny watching them try to speak. <laughs> yeah. even, even Alexa is terrible though. It's uh, yeah. even for basic things like set a timer or turn on the music. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, or at least, you know, open up the Siri or whatever voice assistant API so that people can make better ones. Yeah, uh, yeah. And like, yeah, that's great. that's Apple's sin, you know. They might be really good on being mindful about AI adoption, but 
the closed ecosystem really annoys me. Mm. Um, I was actually recently considering ditching my entire like Apple ecosystem and going back to my Linux roots. Um, maybe that will happen soon. It's too shiny to give away, though, isn't it? It's <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I, I know what you mean. It's uh, I'd love to sometimes. I got a you know Windows right now, but um, Apple is Apple. Apple, Apple is Apple. Um, I have, I have, I think they've pushed me enough at this point that I will actually just buy a cheap laptop and see how how long I can survive on a pure Linux diet. Yeah, and then see how it goes. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of attempts to kill the iPhone, Apple's mm-hmm. flagship product, um, and now we're starting to see potentially some. Many people would say real world possibilities from the humane pin to the rabbit R1. Um, none of them have really taken off yet, but do you think it's possible that more like an AI-focused phone-type product could kill the iPhone in terms of like the number one device people are using every day? Ooh, no. Yeah, um, I'd probably agree with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah Maybe think... AI glasses at some point, but it won't be quite the same as having a screen. Yeah, I, I for one, am rooting for the return of physical keyboards on yeah, my yeah. phones. Like, yeah. I want to go back to the good old days of Blackberries with modern software. Have you seen Clicks? I have seen yeah, Clicks. Yeah, is great. I, yeah. I am going to order. Well, I'm debating whether to order it or not, depending on how the Linux experiment goes. <clears throat> <Yeah, laughs> the only downside is it's going to be huge in your pocket. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a full collection of Blackberries, like, starting from the Pearl all the way to the Key 2. Yeah. You know, their, their failed Android experiments. And I'm like, that was such a good device in terms of, helping me get things done. Um, and I kind of feel like, at least with the state of AI today and what I can see going forward a few couple of years, if I just want to get things done, I don't see how a pin is replacing my iPhone or better yet, you know, my BlackBerry. Um, if I just want to be very precise about what I want to do, I want to go through my 500 Slack messages. I want to respond to them. I want to look at a spreadsheet while I'm going to my train. All of that just doesn't lend itself very well to being done via voice commands. Mm. Um, so I think it ends up being a UI problem. Um, I am hoping for folding phones to become the default phone, though, uh, so that we can get rid of the four-second category of tablets. Yeah. Uh, and then we're all just using folding phones for all of our needs. Yeah. When they get mainstream proper adoption, it will be great because you can use, you know, your, your and, and also a folding phone, how on the outside it has a glimpse for notifications. So it almost replaces the Apple Watch. And then when you open it up, normal phone, and then boom, tablet. It's like free in one. It's, it's Plug in a monitor, turn it into a laptop. Yeah, yeah. Samsung has Samsung yeah. Dex, which I absolutely love. Yeah. Uh, it could do, it could be better, but basically if all you're doing is Slack and Zoom and Word, you don't need a laptop. You know, you can you can just get one folding phone and have everything being done by uh, using that. Um, I'm hoping that the functionality keeps getting added up and added up and added up um, to the point where we can get rid of tablets and then get rid of laptops as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, except except there is a perverse incentive where, unfortunately, Samsung also makes laptops, and it's the same thing why MacBooks don't have touchscreens. Apple also makes iPads, sure. and they don't want to cannibalize their own product lines. The motivation, so got to be right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Final question: um, Should people be more excited or scared about AI? Oh, good question. Um, I can't. I can't speak for what people should do, but I will talk about how my thinking has evolved. Um, I've always been a nerd. I've always loved technology. Um, you know. Did a PhD in computer science because I genuinely love tech. I like making cool new things and I like using cool new things. Um, so there is a side of me which is genuinely enthusiastic about what AI can do. Um, and I I believe the technology itself can be used for a lot of good. But there is another side of me which sees how the last few cycles of technology adoption have gone um, and how the end result rarely ends up being greater human fulfillment, greater societal cohesion, greater happiness. Um, it always ends up being disruptive. It ends up being, in the end, a cost-cutting measure. Mm. Um, so the way that we've structured our economic systems, our social systems, makes me more worried about AI than enthusiastic about AI. Um, not to mention the fact that AI is kind of by 
definition a centralizing technology. I think they were talking about this on the A16Z podcast recently, where uh, blockchains are inherently a decentralizing technology. They are de- distributed by nature. Power gets distributed, it becomes more diffuse. Whereas AI is the opposite. It's a centralizing technology. Computing power gets centralized, builds up a natural monopoly, which can lead to even more consolidation of power. And we already have a very consolidated tech industry. Um, so the core nature of AI combined with our kind of weird, broken economic and social systems and all the mal use cases that I've already seen AI being used for make me a lot more apprehensive than excited. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Good, good conversation. Thank you.